Define and overcome your fear of game devs. Tony Chan here, and welcome to episode 81 of Game Dev Loda, where I chat with the best people in our industry every Wednesday morning. If you need motivation and tactics for a successful gaming career, then this is the podcast for you. Now, let's chat with today's future guest, Richard Ludlow. Did I pronounce that last one right? Yeah, Ludlow, you've, okay, you've Ludlow. got it. Sweet. Uh, Richard, it is game time. Are you ready? I am ready, yeah. So he is the audio director at Hixney Audio, a Los Angeles-based sound and music studio specializing in audio for games and VR. He oversees both the creative and business aspects and has worked on projects for Disney, Activision, Ford, and Chevrolet, so like a variety of companies. He regularly speaks at game music and sound like at GDC and PAX and more. So go ahead, Richard, give us a bit about your personal life and how you got started in the game industry. Yeah, no, good question. Um... You know, I kind of got into everything beginning with music. You know, I was playing violin since I was five and had kind of done that up and up and through high school, you know, very consistently and, and in pri- private lessons and everything. And then in high school was like, oh, I want to be uh, an attorney, basically. <laughs> and uh, that was a weird, weird moment. And uh, and then, you know, like I was on like our mock trial team in high school. And at some point I was like, oh, you know, I was up late, like reading the California penal code. And I was like, what am I doing? This is awful. And so then I was like, forget this. All right. You know, back to music. And and um, and so I kind of doubled down on violin and composition and piano and things like that. And and uh, and started looking into universities with programs and conservatories. And then, you know, I'd never been like classical music, like crazy buff you know i'd done uh done a lot of alternative styles and folk music and and um bluegrass and celtic and whatnot anyway so i found berkeley college of music in boston and um and realized that they also had like a film scoring program and and was like oh you know composition for for media that built really cool so i went to their five-week program and um knew nothing about game audio but when i was there i saw this poster advertising for some class that they're gonna have a guest speaker chance thomas and uh he's uh the composer for lord of the rings online and a a bunch of other things and um and so i i went and i snuck into the class and just sat in the back and no one even noticed i was there um and uh and (laughs) listened to to chance kind of give this lecture about interactive music and that was like the first eye-opening experience and i i'd grown up playing games a bit but my parents had never were never super keen on the game thing so it was always kind of like a treat and so i wouldn't have called myself when i was a kid like hardcore gamer because they wouldn't let me as much but um anyway but then he was showing interactive music stuff and i was like this is the coolest thing ever um, so that kind of kicked off the, the, how do I do that? And I, I went and talked to Allison plant over at Berkeley and was like, you know, how do I do that? <laughs> and she said, um, yeah, we'll come, come back and, you know, in like a, a year or something, you know, when you're, when you're starting at Berkeley, if you get in and, and you can kind of kick off from there. So, uh, yeah, so I basically did that and, you know, I came back, did the, uh, the film scoring major as well as the electronic production and design major. And that's really where I discovered sound design and kind of fell in love with that even, even more than composition. Um, and so I dual majored, but my, my real kind of focus became sound design and, and audio design. Um, and, uh, and both music and sound focused on games specifically. And so, um, but w- especially with sound and kind of, that was the, the birth of that, of whole kind of getting into that, that side of game audio. Um, and you know, Michael Sweet, professor over at Berkeley was like really, really influential in, in kind of that whole early, what do I want to do with my life type of thing? Um, so yeah. Yeah. Michael Sweet, he, he, yeah, he was on the show as you know, and yeah, great, great guy to interview the man's a god. We have a we have a photo of him at the studio. Started as a joke. We had like a a hole in our wall, and we were like too poor to like repair it. So we had a picture frame and printed off of his face as a joke and put it over there. And then <laughs> when we actually could afford to repair the wall later, we moved it to our new studio, and it's still it's still here. But uh, <laughs> it's pretty funny. But does Michael know that you have a picture of him? I think people have told him creepily <laughs> about the, uh, the the photo. But yeah, no, he's uh, he definitely kind of said a lot of people in recent years and, and, you know, on the, the game audio path, um, kind of the, the, the Walter Murch of game audio, maybe question mark. I yeah. Don't know, he, but in, it's only, he influenced a lot of people from what I heard. He like, really has. Yeah. So yeah, I'm so glad to have him on the show. Yeah. I'm glad you, you're on the show now and <laughs> break it down for us, like sound. So you specialize in sound and audio design. Can you uh, give us more details on, on exactly your, you know, your job growth? 
now my job is sending emails. No, I'm just <laughs> but uh, yeah, my my job now is um, as quote unquote audio director here is uh, is kind of twofold. You know, I do most of the like client facing side of interaction. So when we're when we're pitching, you know, to to work on a game, that's that's me kind of selling what we'll do for the game, and that's you know like how should we approach the sound design, how should we approach the music composition, in help with our main composer Matthew, who co owns uh, the studio with me. But um, yeah, so you know, a lot of it is like concepting these early discussions with the developers, figuring out what they want for their game, and then. And then doing all the boring business, you know, contract negotiation things as well. But then uh, in-house, you know, we have, uh, there's seven of us right now. And um, we, you know, a lot of my day is spent kind of going from room to room, you know, listening to the content everyone is making and kind of providing some feedback and, you know, seeing how it fits into these overall visions that we've kind of established with the clients. Um, so it's a lot of, it's much less hands-on than even maybe I'd like. I'd like to be a little bit more hands-on at some point again in the future but it's a lot of you know listening and 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 providing feedback and and system building um you know one of the the things we do at our company really well i think is technical audio design um you know so people will hire us to do specific audio programming or wise implementation uh, our audio programmer uh, technical sound designer nick is is amazing and um and you know everyone here is very technical and we're able to, you know, work on a very deep level on projects as opposed to just kind of throwing assets over the wall. Gotcha, gotcha. And I actually want to go deep into you because I interview a lot of composers and we talk about the music, but now I actually want to talk about like the sound design. It's like, I don't know, like, uh, like a, a sword slash or something or like, can you tell us like a specific sound that you have to like create and how the process of creating that sound? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, Everything is a little bit different, right? I mean, if, if if it's a spell, you're you're trying to capture, you know, the specific functional characteristics. You know, what is this doing, and how can I brand this for the player so that they know, you know, that it's functional, but it's also got to, you know, sound sound sometimes epic or cinematic. Um, and you know, uh, user interface sounds. These are really difficult to do right and get right because they're subtle they're 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 there all the time but again they sometimes are functional so there there's there's this combination of stylistic consideration functional consideration and also just the the feel good factor as well you know a lot of sounds you you can design them and they sound great you know and I'll and I'll be we'll listen to sounds here and be like these will sound great we put them in game and they sound terrible <laughs> it's just like things don't feel good so there's this whole other layer that's different from linear media where with sound design really taking in like what's going to feel good you know and how it's going to be you know triggered and 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 react when the player is triggering the sound as opposed to just listening to it happen on screen and, and that's what I'm so curious about. Like, how, how can you give us an example of like a sound you, that that you know you have to find like a really crazy way of creating that sound and and the process of how you know it feels good. Like, is that based on user feedback? Like, I, I'm just really curious about like the whole process of how you actually get that sound to the point where it feels good, and the, you know, the game developers are satisfied with it, and then you use that sound. And then yeah. also, you have to avoid like copyrights and and of course. I don't know how all that works. That's what I'm just. It's fascinating to me how, like, I remember when I created music for uh, my mobile game and I put it on YouTube. Like, I immediately got like copyrighted strike or whatever you call that thing. So I'm just like, huh. how do you know which sound is copyrighted? Because like, there's so many different sounds out there, I, but some specific sounds can be copyrighted or or is copyrighted. So I'm like curious, how, how does all that work? Yeah, yeah. There were a couple questions there. So let me uh, maybe first like talking about not the copyright side, but just like, you know, how do you get sounds to feel good? Very iterative and like very, you know, you after you keep doing it, you you get better at knowing what will feel good in game. But like, for example, uh, sounds like a gunshot is a very simple sound. You might think, you know, it's Pew! however, like with good gunshots, there's this whole little thing right before the bullet hits, like these like these like, you know, mechanical feedbacky foley things. And these are kind of what make it sound cool as opposed to just the like the is almost like, you know, it's it's like half of the cool experience basically in a gunshot. And 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 you have to think too, like 
sounds need to feel good when they're triggered. Like there's a very immediate need. Like you can't have them have this big ramp up often if they're triggered. Like <laughs> like they have to be because it's like going to happen right then. <laughs> and so it's like these these lead ins and tails are necessary. But if they're too long, then you lose that immediate reaction. So it's just this balance of things. And um and yeah yeah with copywriting things you know I mean usually this is a more of a concern with music than with sound but it can be with sound as well with iconic things and and uh, you know we actually have copyright infringement insurance <laughs> um, oh, that wow. we pay in, in the event we were to accidentally infringe on a copyright we have insurance specific. Uh, to to protect us from that, and our clients often require that we have that specific insurance. But um, you know, I mean, it's it's about you know being inspired by other people's sounds while at the same time making it fresh. And so it's a, it's sometimes a balance there, and sometimes you just don't even know because there's so much out in the world. How could you possibly know every piece of music or sound? And hence the insurance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah. now okay, that that makes sense to me. You you have to have that insurance in case you infringe. I like, I didn't know that. And then, yeah, it's called E and O or like you know like media insurance. More recently, has had a lot of this because it's more common now with all the media being produced. But like E and O errors and omissions insurance is if you accidentally do this. Um, I mean, we, we never have accidentally done it, but uh, to my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's good to have. So real, real quick, what mistakes are most common when designing like specific sounds for a game? And of course, you want to hit that good note. Are there other mistakes that are common, even at a pro level, do, that you notice? Whenever I play a game and 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 don't like the sound in it, I never blame the audio people. I'll just say, you know, I whenever I, I used to be like, oh, like they really messed up the audio here. Now I'm always like, oh, poor audio team got you know, <laughs> screwed. Basically, it's a, uh, you know, the whole. You, you're often you run out of time or there's technical limitations or, or, or there's some other problem. So when there is something that is a mistake, you know, I never know, is it a mistake or is it one of these other mitigating factors the team didn't allow for whatnot? But, but um, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, tendency sometimes to kind of, at least with music, you know, overthink like interactivity. And I think sometimes this can happen. Not, not, of course, interactive music is amazing, but it can sometimes be overbearing. And so, you know, I think once, once, you know, you start designing sound that is more for the sake of the sound as opposed to supporting the functional and visual elements, you know, if you're, if you make your sound really cool, but the sound isn't like need to be really cool. I think that's like a, a detracting thing. So cool sound for the sake of cool sound is, you know, something that always kind of takes me out if it's there. And, and luckily, you know, I mean, you don't see this all the time, but it does kind of like, you know, it happens sometimes and it happens a lot when I'm reviewing demo reels and it's like people one or two years out of school uh, or like, you know, just out of school who have these demo reels that they made while they were in school and those elements are in there and they've designed things that they spent, you know, months on that you might have days on, you know, in the real world to do. And and they've made them sometimes sound so crazy that it's like this just takes me out almost because it's too crazy. Um, you know, so I don't know. That's a weird thought. Um, but do with that what you will. So it's like they're they're over dramatizing the sound in a way or they're, they're exaggerating the sound more than it needs to be. Yeah, and I, and I don't feel like this is a mistake I ever really witness very frequently in, uh, you know, in like commercially released products, primarily probably because they just don't have time to overdo it. <laughs> but, uh, but I do think it's a, a common thing I see in demo reels for applicants um, that we have sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But um, game does be careful or sound designers. Yeah, when you send out those demos, don't don't over dramatize and overall. Uh, Richard, what are your key principles for a top-notch audio gaming experience? Like, give us the key principles. That's a good one. That's a good one. You know, I mean, interactivity is something that's always talked about by everyone in our industry, and I think it's it's very important, you know, to 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 try and push certain things with this because you know it makes the player experience dynamic. It makes it it makes it you know fresh and and all of these things. But I also think you know it can detract sometimes from the experience. I think the most important thing is supporting the player experience. The second you're taking like a player out of the game and bringing the attention and the focus to the sound in a way that is detracting from the main goal of the game. And if it's a puzzling game that is like has elements, maybe you want this, but 
and it's about the specific gameplay type and i think when you when you bring attention to audio be it the sound or music uh through overuse of complexity i think they it can start to hurt the experience i was just right before this this interview uh uh writing up an, a new audio style guide for a project that we're starting and and it's a it's a project that has very specific kind of you know a, a need to like brand things more specifically in terms of you know these are iconic sounds and and kind of something i wrote in there at the beginning was like i'm going to talk about a lot of complex ideas and in interactivity with music and sound and voiceover but like overall we need to make sure we aren't muddying up the experience right like if you're battling a boss like maybe it's great having 10,000 different unique things that he does but maybe it's just as cool having like one or two sounds or one or two vo lines to kind of really brand him as a boss you know to clean things up or to to kind of make a iconic experience i don't know you know there's 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 so many different audio experiences so i think it's hard to say like a unique guiding principle for every single one but i think like detracting from the gameplay and muddying things up with with too much or you know and something i always do i guess from a sound perspective is if if um if we have someone designing a sound i'll often say like play me every layer in this sound and then i'll say like mute layers one seven and eight or whatever right like just trying to thin things so that there's less mush and less you know more clarity i don't know yeah, yeah. Uh, it it drives me nuts when some games have like you know you listen to like a a, a vo of some kind mm-hmm. of side story and then all of a sudden you're battling a lot of enemies and you just hear all these different sounds and and not only that you can't focus on the side story when 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 the vo is talking absolutely so like, man why why did he do that it makes no so, sense voiceover man it's so it's 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 amazing like you know you play a game and you you experience that and I we work on a lot of games and. Regardless if it's an an indie project with the developer having done it for the first time, if it's a if it's a triple A, so consistently, so consistently, the scripts are overwritten and the voiceover is all the time or, or and this often thins out, you know, once they put it in game, they'll see this is a problem and they'll correct it. But every time, you know, we get we get the script to record the voiceover or whatnot and uh, and I say this is just this this is too much in this script. Uh, on like every project and and they're like ah and it and it ends up getting thinned out in the end usually and i think that's very key is just you know overwriting a game from a you know and this isn't even an audio thing but it becomes an audio problem when you have to record it but you know overwriting a game is a very common issue i think a lot of game developers have at the beginning um of a project because it just becomes overwhelming once you once you hear it yeah and, and richard thanks for that thanks for <laughs> helping game, game developers you know create experience that's not overbearing or muddy as you mentioned and absolutely you know and recording temp vo you know yourself or you know even text to speech for goodness sake but putting it in game you know long before you're going to record the actual voice actor gives you an idea oh wow there's just way too much here because you might have the imagination i can say these three sentences you know in like a couple seconds but they once they're performed and acted out they might take you know 15 seconds and it's like wow that was just way too much yeah yeah, definitely practice it beforehand and and now I kind of want to take this on a more personal level and you've been making music for all types of uh, companies. And I'm curious, like what was the worst moment of your career? That one moment that's still vivid in your mind, be very detailed and tell us that personal story. Ooh, there's a couple. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think the game industry is fantastic in many ways compared to other industries uh much less toxic than some linear media industries in terms of you know the understanding that we're making a game and we're not out in the world like battling some disease or or having some other thing but there's there is sometimes just this sense of like urgency that like people will bring to a project that is you know this is much more than a game that we're making or this is much more than a piece of media and they'll you know there's it's it's rare but there have been several instances where you know uh, clients have been somewhat abusive in their in their use of time or expectations that in a way you know like i can't pass on to our employees and so i've had on more than one occasion to 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 tell uh, a client you know 
we aren't going to do this for you. And it's so stressful for me to have to tell a client like, no, like, you know, if they'll say, you know, it'll be like Friday night and they'll be like, you have to come in tomorrow to do this thing, you know, that we, that they didn't tell us about or this thing. And, you know, it's like, and these things like add up, you know, we're at the end of the chain with VO or with, sorry, with audio and things get forgotten and pushed off and, 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 Sometimes, and this happens, of course, with every discipline, but with audio being at such the end, you know, people don't budget for that, the time. And, um, and, and I've had to like tell people no, (laughs) which is difficult for me and, uh, and be the bad guy, you know, so, and, and and ultimately it's worked out really well because people have come to respect us more, but there's been situations where, you know, I've had to say, we are not going to do this for you this weekend, you know, in order to protect our employees, because, you know, I really think employees and creative individuals are the most important, you know, uh, asset our company has, you know, their talent. And if they don't want to work here because they're being abused, um, that's that's a really bad thing. And I think a lot of people in the other industries don't want to say film the film industry in the film <laughs> industry and other industries don't don't seem to have this same understanding that people in the game industry do but you know it, it has uh it has happened and and you know so i think maybe the hardest thing you know or worst moment in the career is like you know telling clients no and saying what are, what are you know in in some of these situations and having very serious conversations with them you know they're very nerve-wracking and saying you know how is this gonna what is this gonna you know uh you know, this isn't gonna. This isn't how this is gonna play out. And ultimately, they've they've come to respect us more for it. But um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's so that's so cool of you for you to look out for your employees like that. Like you you know you don't want to overburden them with these type of projects that might not fit or just don't have time for. And uh, how did you build up that will to say no? Like, because <laughs> I'm like. You say it's a hard thing to do. How how did you build up that skill? Or I don't know if we call it skill, but how did you build up to saying no? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just like I've seen so many colleagues and friends who are abused at, you know, jobs and and they hate, you know, sometimes working where they are. And I and I just I don't want that to be you know, our employees experience since I really do think they are. And so it was really just, you know, somewhat of a no brainer. You know, you have to do it. Most people don't, I don't know, question mark, but, but it just seems like, you know, yeah, if you want good people to, to work, you know, with you, uh, then, then that's kind of a, a thing sometimes. And similarly, I always have to play the bad guy, right? It's a be, be it, you know, um, a client has some idea and I'm like, Oh, this is, this is cool, but not, not really. This is actually not a cool idea. We should, we should try and change this. And they're like, no, we're going to do this. And I'm like, you know, we've, we've done a lot of games, you know, we've done audio for a lot of games. And I can tell you this idea, it's not, it's not so cool, right? It's not <laughs> like, it's, it's going to turn out badly. Like I can, I can guarantee it's going to go badly. And they're like, no, we're going to do it. And I'm like, Oh, okay. All right. You know, I fight the battle and then I come back to our team and I'm like, all right, guys, we're going to, you know, we're going to do this 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 idea and everyone's like richard you're not here making content you know like we (laughs) are you don't understand and i'm like no i understand this is a really bad idea you know like but we're gonna we're gonna try it because they really want and they're like no no we can't do this and i'm like you know i've already (laughs) fought this battle and so sometimes you have to play bad guy uh in in my role as uh with all sides but uh you know ultimately it's uh Ultimately, sometimes clients will will say things and I'll be like, this is a bad idea. And it'll turn out it's not a bad idea. <laughs> so uh, it is good to be pushed for sure uh, in different directions. And, and uh, I think working, you know, in a team like we do, as opposed to just a freelancer, you, you have the opportunity to push each other a lot more by being uh, critical in a good way of each other's work. <laughs> yeah, I like how the back and forth of you and your please. <laughs> That's yes, a, I, I fight funny. the battle, you know, and then I fight the battle again. So it's okay. You just you get you learn to be hated by everyone. No, yeah, and, and it, that's like be that's a part of being a leader of a company. Like you're gonna have to face those type of challenges. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely the, you know, when I when I uh, when I thought about you know when I was working in, in school and and pursuing a career in game audio, I didn't think the hardest part of my future job would be uh, kind of, you know, 
uh, negotiating with with people, be it clients and employees and and things like that. And and it turned out like you know one of the more challenging things has been you know how do you you get everybody on the same page and how do you push toward a goal together and kind of you know take opinions from the clients and other people and and try to you know meld that into a working vision while still preserving the integrity of the the creative content that and the vision. Uh, and that that's been more uh, more challenging uh, than I than I would have initially thought as a challenge. How, how long have you been doing this uh, so far? Not that long. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, man, but you, you're you're learning. It sounds like what you're what you're doing right now. It sounds like you're doing a great job. So I don't know about that. <laughs> I should but, um, I should ask Matthew. That's like Matthew. Is Richard doing a great job? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you should have. No, yeah, Matthew's doing a great job. Yeah, no. Um, so the company is coming up on, I believe, six years in a in a month or two or so of kind of its inception as a concept. But our company um kind of started more as a creative collective in school um and wasn't originally so much a company. But uh, then it started getting more work and and we started doing more projects and and at some point you know what was the original question here. Oh, how did I, how long have I been doing this? Yeah, it kind of evolved <laughs> and, uh, and became, you know, this. And so, uh, you know, we hired our, our first employee, uh, a couple months after graduating and, um, which was, you know, uh, you know, a few years back. And since then, you know, it's been about three and a half years since we reincorporated as a new real company, but um, you know, it's been it's coming up on six, you know, since the beginning of this, and then um, about three and a half as like a as a real company. Hey, congrats, <laughs> man! That, that that's that means like you're doing well. <laughs> it, we'll probably be we'll probably go under next year, but you know. <laughs> now, uh, for for people that want to get into sound design or audio design, what are bad recommendations do you hear uh, that's you know been given out to other people that they should avoid? Yeah, Facebook is. Uh, I read a lot of things on Facebook, and I, you know, a, and and a lot of the things too is like, there's a lot of uh, things I've heard that I've been like, oh, I don't know if that that's a good idea. That then like, you know, I hear from someone, and then like a couple of years go by, and I'm like, oh, that person said that thing. Like they were right. Like I didn't know, you know. So I'm always hesitant to to criticize the opinions of others. Uh, because I don't know, you know, it's, everything is changing, you know, and I kind of, as I, as I work more and learn more, I, I see things in very different lights, but, um, I do see people say a lot, you know, don't work for free, which I totally agree with in, in theory, but you know, I think, I feel like don't work for nothing. And I totally stole this from somebody who I totally forget. I don't remember, but totally not an original thought, but, um, <laughs> you know, don't work for nothing is a much better, uh, concept there. Uh, George Clinton, who was from uh, uh, the chair of the film scoring department at Berkeley, I, he said this or some variant of this that I've kind of taken and, and it's been a long, uh, it's been very, uh, <laughs> I've meditated on this much. There's like three P's in a project, right? Like uh, a cool project. And, and you can take a project if you have any one of these three P's. It's a, it's a cool project. You know, it's like really neat. You love the work that you're going to be doing for it. You love the project. Uh, number two, P is people, right? Like you're working with awesome people or you're building great relationships with people. Um, and the third one's like payment, right? Like it just, it pays really well. <laughs> and you and you can take a project if you have any one of the three of these things. If you get two of the three, that's that's amazing. That's fantastic. You love it. Uh, you'll never get all three. So, but, um, <laughs> but uh, you know, that's, that's generally been true. I think maybe there's a, couple projects where we got all three but you know generally you know the, the, those three kind of peak grinding principles i think are are useful when when picking projects to work on and there are absolutely projects that we will take for much lower cost uh because we find the the project extremely creatively rewarding or because we we really love working with this person or whatnot so i i think kind of these blanket statements of you know don't work for free are are not great, but I definitely, of course, support not just giving away your content just to be able to work on a project. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there has to be some kind of big ROI. Uh, what are the three P's again? Mention it. Uh, mention it again. Uh, cool project, cool people, cool payment. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, right. <laughs> like, uh, I think those are yeah, yeah, yeah. Like not cool payment, but good payment. Anyway, yeah. So those are kind of the uh, 
guiding a guiding principle, perhaps. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I, I definitely got to put that on show notes. That, that's a that to me, that's a good principle right there. <laughs> it's not bad, I don't think. Yeah, George Clinton, I and he stole it from someone else, I think. So you know, it's just a <laughs> perpetual stealing of of ideas in the industry. Yeah, that, that, I'm pretty sure that's normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are the biggest waste of time that we might be doing when we're on this journey on this profession? Yeah. I just just gonna utter an expletive, but then I see your disclaimer about a uh, <laughs> about being PC, yeah, no, or uh, being uh, keeping it PG. But yeah, you know, technology, man, technology just screws us over and over, right? We'll just it's just breaking all the time, and it's and it's like, of course, you're we're working with software that that is released and stable, <laughs> Pro Tools, uh, <laughs> but you know, there's still. Tons of problems and bugs all the time. But then in game development, it's like you're working with software that hasn't even been fully coded and isn't optimized. And it's just and and just the level of complexity with different source controls and game engines and VR technologies that are only half built and not even released yet. People are using them and then clients are upgrading to the the beta builds of the latest Unity engine, which makes it incompatible with Wise. And, and you know, there's just so much technology slow down that is like so much time is spent troubleshooting and and fixing problems and figuring out how to work with new technology and um so i'd say that's one aspect and for specifically from a sound design perspective like some clients are really good about this other clients are really bad about this but like animation changes you know we'll get final locked animation and this is a problem in every industry but like Things that we spend a lot of time doing that just then get totally changed and revised, sometimes numerous times. And so having like good approval processes for, you know, this animation, we're happy with it. And yeah, of course some things change, but like some people just, they lock things and then they're never locked. And it just ultimately we redo things many, many times and and sync changes, you know, everybody complains about these same things. So this is nothing new, but it's like, sometimes it's just a few frames here or there. And it's like, did you really need to cut out those frames? Like that was like a quick little, a quick little delete for you, but it's like a redo for us or something, you know, on the music or so, you know, I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I didn't think about it. Yeah. If they change even like a, a few frames, you would have to change the syncing timing on yeah, that. your music. Yeah. It's like, you know, your music starts out and it's all written and then you just kind of <laughs> budget and you're deleting little bars here and time stretching this here. And, you know, sometimes happens. So food for thought. I always want to, I always try and make friends with the animators immediately and then have a discussion with them about when they are approving things as like done. So Oh, and the programmer. And, you know, basically the whoever is like your point person as the programmer, I usually find out what they like or and then just like inundate them. Like, for example, there's a guy right now. He doesn't know it, but he loves Sriracha and he's a programmer at a company. And right now, literally on our to do list is buy like a crap ton of Sriracha related merchandise and flavors and sauces. And we're just going to send it to him, right? Because he's like our point person there. And then he's going to love us for the rest of the project. We just did this (laughs) with another guy with pies, right? You know, like, I was like, oh, you like pies? Like, I love pie. And I was like, cool. And then the next day we sent like 10 pies to him and they just like appear and they're like, wow, Hexany sent us 10 pies. I love them. I will implement their audio and be nice. You know? (laughs) That is so clever. And it's like, what's the cost of 10 pies for like a two or three year project, right? Where you kick off the relationship with the programmer or whoever and, and... then they, they like you more and care about you more. <laughs> they're gonna remember that, like, uh, oh man, Hexy, they're the one that sent us ten pies. So we're gonna we're gonna use them again. That's, literally, that yeah. I, 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 that's literally something we did. So <laughs> that's so cool. What have you changed your mind about in the last few years, and and why? God, so many things, so many things. Um, Matthew and I have a list we call the mysteries, and uh, and slowly we check things off as they are demystified. Um, man, there was, I, you know, I wrote this note here about this and I, I just literally can't even read it. So I have no idea what I wrote down as, as that particular thing, but there are so many, uh, you know, just probably largely in, uh, in how things work, you know, how people are hired for projects, how, how, you know, companies run and how, uh, you know, why things are the way they are, inefficiencies uh, that I believe are inefficiencies, 
you know, as you work more and more, it, it becomes more clear like, oh, this is why people do things like this or, oh, this is why that happens like that. Or, you know, like you can be like, oh, I'm an awesome composer, great music. I make right the right relationships maybe, you know, and I get called on for this project and then I get the next one. But it can just be totally like political why people are hired for a project or it can be it can be a variety of reasons not necessarily in a bad way but just it's kind of eye-opening to see the longer you know we work in in the industry how things are not necessarily how we perceived them initially and i there's a lot of things like that so the hiring process is something like you just thought it, it works one way but then it's like a whole whole lot of other stuff to it yeah, no, yeah. The hiring process is a good example, too. Like, for example, um, we're hiring right now and um, we're hiring an audio designer. And uh, one, we have like a very clear set of instructions on our hiring page that's like, please submit the following, like one, two, three. And um, it says like, name the PDF this, put this in the email subject. And like half of people don't follow those instructions. Oh, no. I, we, we categorize their things, but I don't even really read Though any application that is incorrect because for us if you can make awesome content that's fantastic but if you can't follow simple instructions then i know that like our clients are going to ask for something and it's just going to get screwed up or it's not going to get delivered correctly or the file names are going to be wrong and it's going to break other things and create more work and so for us like following these simple instructions that we've laid out is like really, really important because of the detail oriented nature of our work. And, um, and like half of people eliminate themselves immediately by not following these instructions. And I don't think that they, I don't think people think that, right. You know, if it says send a PDF and you send a word doc, I just, I, I'm like, Oh, you didn't follow the instructions. <laughs> like eliminated. And uh, same thing with like, you know, there's and there's reasons behind things, too, that people probably don't realize. Right. I'm like, put your link in your cover letter like it says that. And if people put for a demo reel and if people put the demo reel in the email, number one, they didn't follow the instructions. So I have no faith they'll be able to do that necessarily on a project. Uh, but number two, it's, uh, you know, the reason being like we'll pass resumes around and people need to be able to see the demo reels there. And if you didn't put your, you know, demo reel link in the thing, you just put it in the email, then then I have to go do a bunch of work and you put that, you know, link into your cover letter. So when we pass it around, people can see it. And it's just like that's just a clear indication of me that I'm going to have to kind of have to clean up after you and do your work as well, you know, it, when you're an employee here. So you know, following instructions, even though you might not see the like the reasoning behind it or the bigger picture behind it uh, is something that I've learned myself many times as an intern and, and working on projects like, you know, if clients have methods and procedures, I might not realize why and they might seem silly, but I'm going to go ahead and do them because that's their procedure that, you know, kind of works with their game or that they've determined needs to be done. And, and usually there are some reasons behind it. <laughs> yeah. There, to me, I, I noticed that too, where there's like specific instructions game. Though, so you got to follow those instructions because they, they do that on purpose. Companies do that on purpose to see if you're going to take the extra step to do those things that they ask for. So yeah, exactly. definitely do those. <laughs> yep. Yep. Now, you know, you, you've been a CEO for a while or like CEO. for a few years. <laughs> or, That's uh, a joke. Can you really say CEO when there's only seven <laughs> CEO, I know. <laughs> I'm using the wrong word. The leader or, or one of the leader. Head of emailer. <laughs> uh, what do you think was the best investment you've ever made? It could be investment of money, time, or energy. What was that great investment? Yeah, you know, most companies in our industry – don't have salaried in-house employees. They they work with contractors. And I kind of looked at this coming in to the world and was, and then some do, of course. But I, I was like, you know, I feel like developing, you know, an employee's happiness and their investment with the company and their sense of security and 
you know, getting them devoted to your company so they don't need to be thinking, oh, I need to work elsewhere if I'm a contractor was really important. And a lot of people told me that this was a bad idea of hiring a full time employee first thing because, you know, I didn't know if we were going to have ongoing projects. I didn't know if we were going to be able to keep them. A lot of people, most everyone told me that this was a bad idea. Um, but I, I said, uh, you know, this is something that I feel like is really valuable. And so Matthew was actually our first employee. Um, and, uh, we, we found him on Facebook <laughs> and he since has, uh, purchased like, uh, into the company and owns half of it now. But, um, you know, he was our first employee that we, and we made that investment and we were basically, it was pretty stupid though. I do agree. Everyone else was, they were kind of right because, you know, you know, we had put in a little bit of money and it was kind of like, okay, we can survive for two months now with this money. <laughs> and if we don't get enough work, we'll go under. <laughs> Um, but I, I was like, you know, we, we should hire this employee because we can't pitch for new work if we don't, can't take it because we don't have a guaranteed person, you know, kind of dedicated to our company and blah, 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 blah. And, and I really feel like, and we've, and we've followed that. We don't work with any contractors or freelancers. We, everybody's in house, everybody's salaried. And I feel like this has been really important to the success of our company. And I'm not saying everyone should do this or everyone can do this, but I feel like being able to walk over to people and discuss things and being able to have people that you you are very intimately familiar with how to work with and the workflow process and I think it raises the level of quality control and the quality bar and the cohesion in a team and so having you know I, I you know I just personally don't like working with people remotely we're already remote from our clients much of the time most of the time and and I feel like the best investment was kind of in that first employee, having them be salaried and then continuing to hire salaried employees that are in-house. And um, and I feel like being able to develop like our, our team that way was just kind of invaluable. Yeah, you, you make a great point because I know some of my friends that were contract and near the end of the contract, they're already thinking about moving on and they actually tell me like they don't work as hard because they know they're going to leave uh, eventually. Yeah, and I and I do think there's the flip side to that too, though. Like, you know, you can get comfortable at a at a company, you know, and I and, we, and all of our employees are are not like that. But I think you know, employees can become complacent. Whereas contractors, you know, they want to get hired for the next project, so perhaps they do have bigger motivation to, to you know to work really well because they want to get hired for the next project. And so there's there's upsides and downsides to both. Um, but yeah, I just you know we have like a over a hundred page manual for for our company at Hexney um, on like the Bible on how to do everything, and I just you just can't be teaching that to people over and over. <laughs> it's just like it takes like so long to bring a, a new employee up to speed. So yeah. <laughs> wow, hundred pages! <laughs> My gosh, it's well over that. It's uh just how to do everything, like from file names to our processes for uploading to how we spec out volumes to how we work with our Pro Tools sessions to how we, and then, you know, we also have seven core values that our company tries to like embody. And so there's a lot of things and it's like, yeah, having that person stay there and, and read or, or get to know that man. That, yeah, that's a great thing. Um, the game industry is booming. What are you most excited about today? Yes. Yes. That's a good question. Um, game engines are starting to be used, I think, so many more places than just games. They're being used to create theme park experiences, VR experiences, other things that aren't just games, but that are still interactive. And and kind of that's the become the baseline for our company. Not just games, but experiences that use game engines. And there's some really cool stuff being developed uh, and some really cool things we will have coming out in the next few years that are that are games but that are non-traditional in in their in their usage and i think these are and often they're location based um be them for a theme park or something else and there's these really cool things there and you know vr say what you will about it good bad we do a lot of vr and i think it has brought a new attention to audio um developers are approaching us for the very first time and saying audio is so ex important to our experience. And we're like, we know who told you though. <laughs> you know? And so I, I think a new attention has been brought to audio rec by developers recognizing its importance in VR. And I hope this can persist and continue when, when they're not working on a VR project into other mediums as well. But um, so yeah, I think the use of game engines in non-traditional gaming methods and era projects is, is very exciting. 
What was that one game that influenced you the most and, and why? Hmm. Yeah. Um, I'll give a, an older game from when I was younger and then a newer game as well. But, uh, Starcraft with the original was like my jam, right? That is like Age of Empires. And I just, I didn't, I wasn't able to play a lot of games, right? I didn't have a console like until a while because of my parents, uh, and, and they're great and they're super supportive of my career. <laughs> but they, they, uh, you know, so, and consequently, I spent a lot of time doing other things. But Starcraft, right? Like that strategy game was just, it was so influential early on. And I sunk zillions of hours into that with, uh, with my friend, uh, you know, it was just, <laughs> I remember when we changed from dial up, who you didn't have to <laughs> boot people and or drop them, you know, cause you're waiting on the leg, you know, you could connect to battle net though. You go get a, have breakfast while battle net boots up. But, um, <laughs> but you know, so early on that was, you know, that and like age of empires, these strategy games were very influential in, in kind of, developing a love of of games and then more recently um journey was such a powerful game for me uh i don't know just as a whole like of course austin wintry's music was beautiful and and all the sound but just the whole experience you know that was a tearing up at the end there such a spiritual experience um and so that that one in recent years of you know so cliche i know everybody loves journey but <laughs> it really has stood out as as being a you know, it's been a game I've introduced non-gamers to and with them and, and played with them. And and it's been a good, I think it's been a good tool to bridge this world with people who don't necessarily understand it and, and kind of bring a new respect to, to the art. Yeah, Journey, like, I, of course I'm like spoiling that thing, but at the end, I just felt so happy. I was like, crying. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, it gives you this feeling of, of happiness at the end. I, it, it yeah, that I think Journey is a great way to introduce players. Like it, it's just such a great feeling when you finish that game, and it's not long either. So you know, oh, they yeah. play within a few hours. Definitely yeah. recommend that game. For sure. When you're there with your, with your friend and your companion, you're both in the snow and you're freezing, mm-hmm. and it's just all oh, that. Just yeah, <sighs> yeah, yeah. Good, stuff. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. good stuff. Why do you love being a part of the video game industry? Yes, I, I really do. I, I love this community and I think that's the number one reason. You know, it's it's very different from other communities in the media world in that it's so supportive and 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 the people are just so much nicer and <laughs> it's like uh you know the the game audio industry and the game industry they're just they're the people are are great to work with you know it's a it's a younger industry not in terms of age of people working in it well yes in terms of age of people working in it but that's not what i mean you know the film industry has been around a long time and it's kind of established these these this is how things work and that's not true in the game industry, right? There's there's people always open to crazy new things and just, I don't know, it's, people are just nicer, I think. And that's honestly like a, a big reason we work on games is like the people and that, you know, people want you to have lives. We're so, you know, very rare. You know, I was talking about previously that we kind of get you know, quote unquote abused on a project. It's It's very rare within the game industry because almost all of our clients are just really, really great about, you know, understanding people have lives and and time and 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 i feel like that's so special to be able to to work in an industry that is not nearly as toxic as so many others yeah and that's really good to hear because you know people hear stories about crunch time and all these horror stories but then there's like this other side too where the people they so passionate about making great games for people and they're just nice to work with and so there's lots of great reasons to join the game industry as well yeah, absolutely. And there's so much opportunity, I think. You know, there's a lot of people trying to work in game audio and in games, but you know, there's a lot of uh there's a lot of games being made. <laughs> Lots of games, definitely. With the new tools and everything's becoming accessible, there's it's just no no excuses game does. You just gotta find a way in, you know, go to game events and network. So uh, awesome the show isn't over yet it gamed us before we go into the lightning round if you enjoyed okay. the episode <laughs> if you enjoyed the episode and you want to hear more inspiring stories and make sure you subscribe to the podcast on itunes or overcast so uh, richard i will ask you quick questions and you'll be giving us more valuable information in return are you ready to crush the lightning round yeah i'm looking at my papers here i'm like where are the questions for the lightning round but there are none are there <laughs> <laughs> what was holding Perfect. you back from joining the game industry um, 
Nothing really, honestly. I, I went to the school, uh, you know, went to Berkeley, saw Chance's lecture and was like, that's for me. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I think something that does hold people back maybe is, is, uh, you know, the ability that you sometimes you have to, you have, there's sometimes a big financial investment of like time and like conferences and networking and, and going without making money initially. And, and I feel like that particular thing is, can be a barrier for some people. Um, and thankfully it, it wasn't so much an issue, I um, mean, you know, I was able to start working right away and things, but yeah, there were no like, oh, I don't know if I want to go into the game industry because of this. I was like, let's go for it. <laughs> we went in. That's what I'm talking about. What's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Ah, yeah. Um, organization. Like I'm a fairly, like if I don't write things down, I will forget them. Absolutely. And so consequently, it has made me hyper organized, like, and I, I, you know, every email I send, I set a reminder that I have like a thing that does it, you know, to follow up with that person every, you know, I just, I walk around all day and Siri, all these reminders and they make Trello cards and they slack. Yeah. We have this whole thing, yeah, thing up where I say Siri and it makes a Trello card. It slacks our producer. It's all automated and everything, but just like being on top of your shit, you know, is like, if you, you can be a great creative in any, any field, but if you can't like play ball with these larger complex projects and keep track of a lot of things, then, then you're screwed. And, <laughs> and I think that's been very important to, to my own success has been being able to remain hyper organized because there are a lot of comp- moving pieces when with game development. Yeah, I can't imagine because you're working on so many different projects with different companies and, and then different sounds for different for like different uh, objects or characters. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. We've, we've thinned a lot of our projects, you know, we, people come to us for, for very specific things now, Matthew's music or, or technical audio work. You know, I mean, we're not working on like dozens of projects by any means at the, at the same, at the same time, but just within a game, there's a lot of moving pieces and yes, we do work on several projects at a time, you know? Um, but so, yeah. What's the uh, best piece of advice you've ever received? I had this teacher in high school who said this, and this sounds like terrible, but I think that the premise of it is is solid, <laughs> and that's uh you know uh, fake it till you make it, and I and I don't say you should lie and fake it, but I think, you know, if you don't have confidence in what you're doing when you're when you're discussing it with other people or when you're doing your work, like I think that I think that's very, very bad. You know, early on, uh, we had started this company, creative collective company, whatever you want to call it, you know, and, um, in pitching it to other people and in trying to get work, I was never like, Oh, you know, student, you know, trying to figure all this out. You know, I was like, yeah, you know, we're a creative collective. We work on games. It was absolutely true. You know, I, in being confident in this, you know, kind of, you know, willing it into existence was, uh, was a, as a strong factor in, in, uh, in things coming together. And, um, so, I, well, I don't know about the exact words of fake it till you make it, because I think it has a bad connotation of, you know, implying you should fake it <laughs> until you make it. Um, I think the the idea of not, you know, of, of having confidence in what you intend to be and where you want to be in five to ten years and, you know, doing the things now as if you are, you know, five to ten years from now, you know, that making that your reality can really help kind of propel you forward. Yeah, I do believe like it's, sometimes it's good to think big and you know push yourself uh, beyond your boundaries. And what can people do to, I guess, build up that confidence? Because you know it it is something that it's hard to do. I think sometimes like did you do something in general to be like, uh, hey, we, we got this, we could do this. Let's just go for it. Like what what push you or something? Yeah, on a very tangible level, something I see all the time at conferences is people put like student on their badge, right? And it's like, what is your identity, a student or what you're studying? Like, are you studying composition? Then you're a composer. You know, are you studying art? Then you're an artist, right? Like your identity isn't that you're learning necessarily. Of course, you're, you know, we're always learning, but your identity is that you are a game artist. or And so I think people misrepresent or misbrand themselves. And then people look at them, you know, if they meet them and, and they say, oh, like, you don't, you know, not, not that being a student is a bad thing in, in the least, but you know, if, if people are self identifying themselves on like name tags that they wear, <laughs> that they are, you know, not, you know, don't know how to do necessarily what they're doing. I think that that's an immediate kind of thing that I think can, people can improve with their interactions with others, you know, but, uh, you know, what can people do to build up the confidence? You know, I, uh, 
a lot of things, I feel like just jumping into things on projects when you're, you know, presented with the opportunity to do them, you know, doing tutorials and everything, of course, extremely valuable. But, you know, the most the best way to learn is by doing these things on projects. And it's a totally catch 22 because you can't work on a project until you have experience working on a project. And if you don't have experience working on a project, you can't work on a project. So it's just like at some point it's a catch 22. I don't have a good answer. But, you, know, <laughs> you just got to go in. It's you're something just diving in. Yeah. And just, dive. You know, Forcing yourself. <laughs> what resources should we use to dive in? Especially for, you know, in your profession, like what resources should we be using? There are a lot of great tutorials and like, you know, it's a weekly occurrence where some eight year old teaches us how to script something. Not really. You know, we have a program, thank God, but it used to be a more regular occurrence on YouTube. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of great tutorials out there for software and for learning. Now, you know, uh, Matthew, who owns the company with me and is a phenomenal composer in, in my opinion, my skewed opinion, uh, you know, he, he, uh, didn't go to Berkeley. He didn't go to a music school. He did take music classes at a college, but he didn't, you know, get a degree from a college. Um, he dropped out of high school, actually. Well, he tested out early, you know, just because he wanted to pursue music, you know, and and that passion to just go learn himself and then also learn from other people, uh, you know, outside of outside of a traditional formal, you know, two hundred thousand dollar education, <laughs> totally enabled this. Um, you know, this career and, you know, he's just all walk by sometimes and he's just sitting there like reading like Mozart scores or whatever, you know, and it's not like he needed to go to, to some crazy school to learn how to do that. So I think the, the resources are out there. They're online. They're in books like you can absolutely learn how to do so much of this stuff. And I use Matthew as the use case. <laughs> this is the example all the time. He, uh, you know, he apprenticed for free at some for at some, uh, you know, um, for uh, a recording studio for many years and I did five unpaid internships personally but you know I know a lot of people can't afford to do unpaid internships so I totally understand that that's like a barrier but if you can you know doing these these internships and things I think are really good introductions and that's where you can kind of get hired somewhere where you have no experience but they will take you onto a project and then you can get that experience doing a project awesome awesome and real quick Last question before we're, we're almost hitting that hour, but last question, and this is a bit, it's a bit of a doozy. So imagine you woke up the next morning in a brand new world and you knew no one. You still have all the experience and knowledge you currently have today. Your food and shelter is taken care of and you had a laptop. What would you do step by step on the path to join and become successful in the game industry? It's a great question. Uh, I'd probably take that laptop and look up where uh, the next uh, uh, game development meetup is because honestly, people have been the most important part of our success in this industry, connecting with individuals, right? Like you can send all the cold call emails you want. You can network on forums and blah, 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 blah. But meeting individuals has hands down been the single most important thing to our success. You know, we work on a project or I do an internship somewhere or whatnot. People I work with leave that company, they go to another company, they refer us, or you meet someone in a sandwich line up at PAX, you know, and it's like, I swear to God, we've been working with this client like three years and just we met buying sandwiches in at PAX. Um, and it's just like, connecting with people because people make games, right? Like, if you want to work in this industry, it's not always about just your locking yourself and learning your craft it's about connecting with other people and i feel like that is the single most important thing to to kicking your career off and continuing success um you know a lot of people who have been in the industry for years sometimes uh that have really successful titles will sometimes uh not maintain new connections i think of meeting more people and new people and, and maintaining relationships and sometimes it's detrimental later in their careers so people 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 all the way around <laughs> go network game dallas yeah you heard richard yeah you just got to make those connections we have reached the end go ahead and give us one last part a piece of guidance and how we can connect with you and then we'll say goodbye for sure. Maybe I'll temper my last piece of guidance, which was people, people, people. You know, like meeting people is great, but like we have an internal policy at our company that is like we don't give out business cards unless people ask for them. You know, spamming yourself to people, really bad idea, right? It's about like I'd rather go to a conference, have one really long conversation for a whole day with one person and connect with them on a very personal level than meet like 80 people because I feel like that relationship is going to be so much more engaging and valuable. So, tempering that there you go and uh yeah 
connecting with me, uh, email's great. Uh, R. Ludlow, R L U D L O W, at hexanyaudio.com, H E X A N Y audio.com. Um, but yeah, you know, our website has kind of stuff for contacting us. So hexanyaudio.com, H E X A N Y audio.com. And um, yeah, would be happy to answer emails from, from anyone. Um, and uh, yeah. Yes, a game does hit him up. I mean, it. it this episode has been great, Richard. Thank you so much. He like he shares so much great stuff, and Game does ask him questions. He's willing to help <laughs> you. It, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us. For that, we are truly grateful, and we will catch you next time. Of course, and I'm sure next time I'm going to contradict like 800 things that I said this time because <laughs> I will have learned more. <laughs> Thank you, Game Guys, for listening. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, listen to my show. Go to GameDevLoadout.com and type in the number 81 in the search bar to find Richard's episode for all the awesome show notes that we just talked about where you can connect with them and check out the resources. Until then, keep on making great games. I'm Tony Chan. I'll catch you next Wednesday on the Game Dev Loadout podcast. Peace.